Labdien, dāmas un kungi! Turpināsim konferenci pēc iepriekšējā paneļa, kur mēs apskatījām tādas samārā vispārējas un organizāciju un ekspertus un ekto viedokli. Mēs šī panelī skatīsimies uz konkrētiem piemēriem, respektīvi iesim no tāda, ja var salīdzināt, ja iepriekšējā panelā mēs apskatījām tāds vispārīgs jautājums, kur izbraucām pa lielošo, korupcijas sviestu lauku ar grābeklu, noņēmām tādu virspustu, tagad mēs ieiesim konkrētās lietās, un mums būs gan trilleris Brazīlijā, gan big data un tāds datu analīzes paraugu stunda no Bulgārijas, un mēs arī runāsim par Gruzijas problēmām, kas ir ļoti līdzīgas kā Latvijā. Piemēram, ar Facebook profilos informāciju redzamo tuvojoties vēlēšanām. Šo jautājumu mēs esam runājuši gan knāba konsultīvās padomas sēdē, un skaidrs, ka šie jautājumi aktualizējās vēl tikai pieminot politisko partiju finansēšanas jautājumu, gribās teikt un skatoties uz nākotni, tas, ko mēs šobrīd redzam, ka televīzija vēl joprojām spēlē vadošo lomu lielākajā daļā valstu, tad elektroniskie mēdīji vai dažās valstīs jau ir pārņēmuši vadošo lomu vai to līdz pārņems neizbēgami. Līdz ar to nevienam nav tādas perfektās receptes vēl, bet ir vairāk kas valsts, kas šobrīd saskarās ar to, ka milzīgi resursi tiek ieguldīti tieši internetā un politiskās reklāmas tiek organizētas tieši tur. Tāpēc tādas lietas kā Facebook un citas lapas kļūst ar vien aktuālākas. Un tur Gruzijas kolēģis centīsies ilustrēt, ja ne uzreiz ar izcinājumus, tad vismaz to problemātika ieskacēt. Bet ļaujiet sākt šo panelu tiešām ar fantastisku stāstu no Brazīlijas, kur zināmas paralēles var būt velkamas ar mūsu oligarku lietu vai citām, lielākajām lietām, ja mēs to paraizinātu, piemēram, ar simts vai vēl vairāk, jo tās kopējās summas, kas ir iesaistītas šī konkrētajā lietā, ir virs miljārda eiro. Cilvēki, kas ir ielikti cietumā, šobrīd apcietināti ir vairāk kā simts, ir iesaistītas neskaitāmas valsts kapitāla sabiedrības Ir iesaistīta gan pozīcija, gan opozīcija politiskā, jo visi zinat, ka politikā ir kompromisi, reizēm, lai ne tikai pozīcija tiek pie labiem amatiem un kukuļiem, arī opozīcija ir jāpadalās, ja viņi grib dabūt kādu lēmumu cauri, un tas viss ilustrējās šī konkrētajā gadījumā. Vēl kas ir pārsteidzoši, ka šis viss process notiek uzmanieti slēpti vai publiski? Noteikti. Pilnīgi publiski visa informācija, praktiski visa informācija ir atrodama elektroniski un izmeklēšanā faktiski tiek iesaistīta sabiedrība, lai nodrošinātu to, ka veidojās uzticamība gan izmeklēšanas procesam, gan turpmākajai pārvaldei, jo šī lietā ir iesaistīta tiešām ļoti daudz politiskas figūras, Un vēl kas svarīgi, šī lieta kā daudz citas lietas nesākās kā korupcijas lieta, viņa sākās kā maza lieta naudas atmazgāšanas lietās. Bieži vien arī Al Capone tika noķērts dēļ nodokļu krāpniecības. Naudas atmazgāšanas šobrīd lietas ir vienas no tādām izplatītākajām ir tīpaši Latvijā. Labi, bet atstājuši arī kaut ko Seržajo runāt par šo lietu, tad Seržajo Fernandes, prokurors no Brazīlijas, viena no lielākajām pasaules korupcijas lietām šobrīd joprojām atklāta, saņēmusi jau vairākas balvas gan no Transparency International, gan no citiem 
Lūdzu, Sergio, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Labin. Initially, I would like to thank uh, the CANAB, Kahoot Corruption Prevention and Convention Bureau, the Parliament of Slavia, the School of Public Administration, and the State's Chancellery for the chance to be here and share this experience with you. I came here today to tell you a story. But before I begin, uh, I, I must give you a brief overview of Brazil, my beloved country, where this story take, takes place. Brazil is the world's ninth largest economy. Despite its continental size, Brazil has only one language spoken throughout its territory. This, the Portuguese. Brazil has no problem with religion disputes or race issues. Brazil, since the 90s, has been consolidating itself as a stable democracy. Brazil overcome inflation and overall has a solid economy. Brazil does not suffer from natural disasters, such as earthquakes or hurricanes. It has a great climate and a vast arable land. Brazilians, in general, in general, are friendly and happy people. Brazil, throughout its history, has excellence in several areas, such as sports, literature, aviation. In addition, Brazil also stands out in music, fashion, science, and so on. All these features should make us proud. However, Brazil suffers from a highly contagious and damaging disease called corruption. This disease masks the many good things that Brazil has. As I have said, I came here today to tell you a story. It's a story of corruption, which has the power to inhibit private investment, reduce economic growth, increase the cost of doing business, and can lead to political instability. More than that, corruption can deprive the countries of their resources to invest in health care, education, security, and essential, essential services from the population. In short, corruption costs lives. I should say it can kill. Corruption actually kills people. Today, I'm going to tell a story about corruption in Brazil. This story has a title, The Car Wash Operation, as we call it in Brazil. The car wash is essentially an investigation of corruption and money laundering involving the state-run oil company Petrobras which is Brazil's largest company and one of the largest cor corporations in the world. The amount embezzled is huge. We are talking about billions of dollars being channeled. It's the largest corruption scandal in dollar terms in any democracy ever. This investigation implicates the most powerful politicians and prominent businessmen along the country. Actually, this scandal is shaking the Brazilian political establishment and rocking the country socially, economically, and politically. This investigation is being conducted mainly in three cities of Brazil. It all began in 2014 in a city in the south of Brazil called Curitiba, identified by that blue arrow on the map. Afterwards, the investigation led to the involvement of several lawmakers, and because of that, other inquiries started at Supreme Court in Brasilia, 
the capital of Brazil, represented by the yellow star in the middle of the map where I work. Also today, there is a large part of the investigation being held in Rio de Janeiro, the second biggest city in the, in the country, represented by the purple arrow. The criminal scheme involved three main groups of players. Top executives from Brazil's major construction companies, directors of Petrobras and Brazilian politicians. In summary, that's the way it worked. First, construction companies created a cartel to coordinate bids for the Petrobras contracts and systematically overcharge the company. Because Petrobras is partially owned by the state, politicians can appoint people of their trust as executives. These select groups of Petrobras employees turned a blind eye to the frauds, allowing, allowing the construction companies to charge Petrobras inflated prices. Then, the construction executives rewarded their partners inside Petrobras with big bribes. The, the directors of Petrobras, therefore, transferred, transferred around 60% of the bribes to the politicians who had sponsored them. They commonly used the money to enrich themselves as well as to invest the illegal amounts in their own political campaigns. In summary, Billions of dollars have changed hands as part of this scheme. This scandal came to light almost by accident. In 2014, the investigation started as an inquiry into a money laundering operation at a local car wash. That's why the name. This car wash was related to a unknown black market currency operator. His name is Alberto Youssef. However, during the common investigation, during this common investigation, a new character came up and changed the whole scenario. I'm talking about Paulo Roberto Costa, a former director of Petrobras who had received an expensive car from Youssef. This connection between a Petrobras director and a black market operator aroused suspicious and conducted the investigation towards another direction. Afterwards, these two men were preventively arrested. Youssef as a, a suspect of participating in, this, in a criminal scheme and Costa for, de for destroying evidence which connected him to Youssef. Eventually, Costa and Youssef agreed to engage in a plea bargain deal. This way, the scope of the investigation became wider and end, ended up reaching major construction firm as well as several politicians. Collaboration agreement are making all the difference in car wash. Were it not for the collaboration agreement, the car wash case wouldn't have an uncovered evidence of corruption beyond that involving Costa and Youssef. In fact, these two agreements were surely a turning point in the investigation. To date, we have almost 200 agreements already settled and many other candidates willing to collaborate. Among those who have agreed to make the collaboration agreement are businessmen, politicians, public servants, and financial operators. In this type of criminal investigation, it's very important to keep public opinion well informed. As you, as you may know, we are living in a moment of a post-truth era, where facts are twisted 
and the truth is ignored to give away to emotions and versions. I mean, white-collar criminals are very skilled at distorting the truth. For this reason, keeping society up to date on the achievement is very important. These are some achievements that have been reached so far and can be easily viewed on a website specially created for the case. This website, besides data, gives several details about the ongoing investigation. But I suppose the most important question is, will this scandal change anything in the, in the reality of Brazil? I think this case has already changed something in Brazil. Let's take a look. These are some achievements that I would like to highlight. Today, the president of Brazil is being formally charged with corruption obstruction of justice and leading a criminal organization. Three former presidents have been charged with corruption and obstruction of justice. The former Speaker of the House of Representatives is in jail. The former president of the Senate are being charged with corruption. The government leader in the Senate was arrested during his term in office and then ended up signing a collaboration agreement. The current president of the Senate is under investigation. The former governor of Rio de Janeiro, several lawmakers, ministers, and business, businessmen are in jail right now. Hundreds more congressmen, ministers, governors, mayors, political bosses, and powerful businessmen Business executives are formally charged with crimes. This scenario, a few years ago, was totally unlikely in Brazil. In other words, something has been changing in Brazil. I, it can be denied. But how many cases like that must happen to change a country? This is a relevant question. I'm not sure about the answer. But car wash itself will not do this alone. It can help but to change hundreds of years of impunity, we need more than that. We need a deeper, a deeper change. Nowadays, corruption does pay in Brazil. Corruption today is a low risk and a high benefit crime. We need to make corruption a high risk because the damage it produces is very harmful. In Brazil, it used to be very unusual to see people in prison because of corruption. Fortunately, because of car wash, things, are, things start working differently. The powerful are being arrested and, their, and their, their assets are being seized. Since the beginning of the investigation, more than a thousand warrants for search and seizure have, have been fulfilled. However, the car wash accomplishment remains unusual. Our wish is that cases like car wash become the rule and no longer something rare. Corruption is the product of a number of factors and conditions. Therefore, it's not an issue regarding some individuals or a certain group of people who have corrupted themselves. We are talking about a systemic problem. It's a whole environment that encourages this kind of crime. In other words, there are several factors that may explain widespread corruption. But the most critical I would point out is impunity. The problem persists throughout Brazilian history. 
Actually, until a until few years ago, the chances of a member of an upper class being arrested, especially in the case of a politician, were almost new. But things just started to change with car wash. So I think this is the first step. In other words, we realize it's possible to change something. Now we want to go further. In order to improve the legislation, we have campaigned nationwide to convince the Congress to vote a bill containing 10 measures that could certainly improve the legal system in Brazil. This campaign obtained more than 2 million supporters around the country. The society pushed the parliament to approve this pioneer anti-corruption bill, but the lawmakers didn't consider the public appeal and reject the proposal. In fact, car wash is, pushing, is punishing co corrupt politicians from all parties, no matter if they are right wing or left wing. Almost all big parties are involved. This may explain why this bill was rejected. So the question should be how long the improvements achieved so far will persist in the near future. I mean, Operation Car Wash has stirred up the establishment and face up to the powerful. Indeed, we are worried about what will come after the dust has set if the politicians and businessmen involved in the case have tried to influence the investigation. The answer is yes. We have had cases of attempts to silence people by offering money and making veiled threats. However, there is another kind of interference that is much more damaging in this particular case. The Brazilian Congress, through, through several politicians involved in car wash, has been trying to approve bills that can harm not only this operation, but also other similar investigations to be held in the future. These laws usually come disguised as legitimate acts pretending to serve the public interest. However, there is a self-interest hidden in this legislation. In other words, some politicians are trying to get away with their crimes by changing the legal system. They will certainly keep trying to retaliate and use their power to weaken car wash and make sure that another successful investigation does not take place in the near future. The only thing that can avoid this imminent, this imminent threat is a vigilant and aware public opinion. What do Brazilian, Brazilians think about the whole process? The Brazilian society is supporting us and the car wash operation itself. Indeed, car wash became a national heritage and we have been succeeding largely because of that. In this picture, you can see in a soccer game in Maracanã Stadium, uh, uh, the, the sentence where you can read, in soccer country, my idol wears a suit. This is a reference to one of the judges of the case. His name is Sergio Moro. Here's some, some images of the support of the society. This protest protest in front of Congress. Every time the, the politicians involved try to change the legislation to weaken the prosecution office or the judiciary, the population went out to protest against it. But we know that this scenario can change very quickly. Many politicians and tycoons are skilled in manipulating the facts. The corporation involved, as you know, have a lot of money to spend in propaganda. 
we must be alert. We still have a lot of work to do. In fact, we currently know that this scheme is spread into most of the state-run companies and government agents throughout Brazil. That is to say, these unveiled crimes go beyond Petrobras. There are many other state-run companies under investigation, and each cooperation agreement settled leads to new evidence that triggers the necessity to open new path in the investigation. On the other hand, we have to keep a watchful eye on attempts of weakening the investigation applied by the powerful actors involved in the case. As you can see, the car wash case has been a tipping point in the fight against corruption in Brazil. For the very first time, Brazil has been witnessing white-collar criminals going to jail and remaining there for more than 24 hours. This is a meaningful progress for us. Another gain is the highlights put, put on the promiscuous relationship between public and private sectors. This must be overruled. But all this, I insist on it, will only happen whether the society stays, stays vigilant. Well, my colleagues, this is the story that I came here to tell you. Inside this story, there are many other stories. For some of the involved, this, the story has ended or is about to end. For many others, it's just the beginning. Paudis, thank you for listening. Paldies, Sergio. Es domāju, ka šis stāsts labi ilustrēja, kā darbojās korupcijas tīkli un kā state capture, jeb, jeb valsts nozakšana izpaužās un, un kā labs piemērs, ka, viņš var, ka šādas schēmas var tikt arī veiksmīgi apkarotas. Tālāk mēs no Brazīlijas virzamies uz dienvidu austrumu Eiropu, lai gan patiesībā jau demokrātijas pētniecības centrs Bulgārijā strādā Eiropas līmenī. Arī man ir tas gods piedalīties vienā no projektiem, ko, ko vada šis centrs, un tas ir saistīts ar tieslietu sistēmas novērtējumu respektīvi Eiropas Savienības fondu ieguldījums Latvijas tieslietu sistēmā pēdējos desmit gados. Bet uh, Aleksandrs Gerganovs uh, ir uh, viens no vadošajiem cilvēkiem šī organizācijā, kas strādā ar korupcijas un lielo datu jautājumiem. Un ir izstrādājis arī metodoloģiju, kā novērtēt uh, korupcijas uh, iestādes, korupcijas tendences, balstoties uz makroekonomikas datiem, jeb kvantitatīvajām metodēm. Latvijā mēs pamatā, lai vērtētu korupciju, izmantojam kvalitatīvos pētījumus, respektīvi uz intervijām balstītu informāciju vai ekspertu sniegto viedokli. Līdzīgi kā ēna ekonomikā ir, ir, ir dažādas metodoloģijas, var, var skatīties uz Schneideri kunga pieeju uz kvantitatīvo datu mērīšanu, līdzīgi kā to piedāvā Aleksandrs, var skatīties uz Saukas kunga pieeju, kurš izmanto kvalitatīvo informāciju vairāk uz intervijām bāzētu. Aleksandrs Gerganovs sniegs informāciju par, gan par šo metodoloģijas pieeju, gan kopumā, kā izmantot lielos datus korupcijas atklāšanā. Please. Thank you. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be here and first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me. Uh, today. Okay, thank you all for uh, being here and I'm glad to present to you uh, some of the more classical 
and the state-of-the-art anti-corruption monitoring tools, which uh, are de developed by the Center for the Study of, the, of Democracy in Bulgaria. It is an independent NGO think tank, which uh, focuses on anti-corruption measurement, among other things. And uh, I appreciate uh, the invitation and would like to thank the organizers for being here. Uh, today conference started with a uh, graph uh, with, with uh, presenting how Latvia was doing uh, in the Corruption Perception Index, which is not surprising because at the end of the day we need uh, some assessment of how uh, anti-corruption policies, anti-corruption laws and uh, all the efforts which go in that direction actually translate to measurable effects. And uh, I was surprised to see uh, this graph, which you can see also in the CNAP uh, book on page three, which so shows a sort of a wave where corruption pressure goes down, then uh, stay still for several years, then falls down again in 2006, and then starts to rise in 2011, where the scores are pretty high, and then falls again, but in 2016, it starts to rise again. So uh, I, have, I haven't seen this graph before today, but uh, incidentally, I have several graphs in my presentation which are very similar to this. Uh, first of all, I will start with a very traditional anti-corruption measure which the center uses. It's called the Corruption Monitoring System. And uh, it uh, uh, started 20 years ago when the dialogue with policymakers uh, was a bit difficult in Bulgaria. Uh, then the corruption measurement was dominated by corruption perception. Uh, indexes, and uh, when data about corruption perceptions were presented to policymakers, uh, what they said was, okay, but this is all hearsay, uh, the media is influencing people, uh, these are not actual corruption cases, uh, the, the opinion of people uh, is uh, influenced a lot by different parties, by propaganda and so on. And it was hard to argue with that because uh, they have a point in this. Uh, for example, if you uh, have a case of a successful, uh, successfully unraveling a corruption scheme, as, uh, as was presented right before me with the car, uh, with the car wash case, uh, what do you think that uh, the public perce perception will do? W would it go down because uh, this was a successful uh, investigation or would it go up because the investigation unravels uh, how uh, large and prevalent corruption actually is? Uh, that's why we uh, built this system uh, 20 years ago and uh, included it in, in it not only assessments of corruption, but also attitudes of citizens, and the most important thing is experience-based corruption indicators, like the corruption pressure, uh, which I'm showing in this graph, and it represents a, uh, a percentage of the citizens uh, in several countries which uh, uh, were uh, asked for a bribe by a public official during the year previous to the survey. So this is a, a sort of a victimization survey, national representative. And you can see that in Albania, for example, uh, about half of the population uh, reports being asked for a bribe by a public official. And even in, in the best uh, uh, in terms of this uh, indicator countries like uh, Croatia, uh, they still uh, uh, one-tenth of the citizens were asked for a bribe. And uh, this facilitated the dialogue with policymakers quite a lot because they can't say that the, this is just hearsay. These are uh, people who report actual corruption incidents. And uh, everyone started 
questioning the uh, judiciary, the, the anti-corruption efforts of investigators. Why are there so many uh, reports of corruption incidents, but uh, so few cases uh, in court, and even fewer uh, effective sentences? And uh, you can see here that uh, this graph shows the difference uh, from an international study between 2014 and 2016. And you can see that some countries uh, perform better in the latest wave of the survey, like Bulgaria, Montenegro. The green arrow, uh, arrow shows uh, that uh, corruption pressure dropped there. Uh, and in other countries like Bosnia uh, or Macedonia, the green arrow goes up. However, if you take a longer trend, you now uh, start to see this wave pattern in corruption pressure dynamics. The corruption pressure sometimes goes up, sometimes goes down, but then rises again. There is no stable trend of uh, decreasing corruption pressure. And this is, about, uh, this is uh, corruption pressure in Bosnia uh, since 2001. And you can see the same pattern in Macedonia. Again, it rises, then falls, which we say great success. Then, however, it rises again. So it is not great success because uh, it, the, 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 the effect is not stable. And in Bulgaria, we have the longest trend, which you can see uh, almost the same thing as in the corruption perception index graph of Latvia, you can see at first uh, decline, then stable, uh, stable values, then again decline in 2010, and then in 2014 there is this huge spike. Uh, it started uh, because of uh, um, political uh, political changes in the cabinet, but uh, you can see that administrative corruption even now is as high as it was in the early uh, century. Uh, so uh, it is very important to monitor uh, and not only perceptions, but actual experience-based indicators and monitor them in time and to, to watch it the whole graph before we say that there is progress or not. And uh, as a whole, this uh, international survey in South and East European countries shows that there is some improvement uh, since the very early waves. However, uh, in most of the countries, this improvement is not stable. And the natural question we are now asking is how effective are the anti-corruption measures? Because during these years, they, there were very many anti-corruption measures. Anti-corruption bodies were, uh, were uh, organized and started acting uh, similar to NAP and other also. And everyone is talking about anti-corruption. The problem is admitted. Uh, by everyone and uh, policymakers uh, and government officials say that they do their best to uh, fight corruption. However, uh, people tend to disbelieve them. This graph shows what percentage of the citizens uh, in the corresponding countries think that corruption cannot be substantially reduced. So in most of the countries, more than half of the population don't believe in the government capabilities of actually reducing substantially corruption. And this brings us to one of the problems in corruption measurement. Uh, and it is that it focuses on mostly on administrative corruption and even corruption perceptions. And more or less on corruption measurement. However, uh, the anti-corruption measures uh, which try to prevent corruption and fight corruption, uh, they are very seldom measured or they are, seldom, uh, they are, they are measured uh, in terms of uh, how uh, formal laws or policies are implemented, which shows what's going on on paper, but not always what's going on in reality. And uh, one of the recent attempts of the center in Bulgaria uh, was to build this uh, anti-corruption policy uh, assessment and monitoring tool called MACPI, 
which uh, tries to focus on uh, anti-corruption policy assessment at the level of public organizations. Because, for example, uh, national laws like asset declaration, when they get to a particular public organization, they uh, often don't work as they are supposed to. Uh, so the classical tool uh, here on this graph, it's called MACP officials. It focuses on uh, public organizations and how anti-corruption policies work there. Uh, however, as you can see uh, on the graph, there are different levels, both in uh, corruption and in anti-corruption. And uh, for example, the high-level corruption, I, I quote on this graph, uh, state capture, uh, is one uh, very important phenomenon which uh, has attracted the attention of researchers around the world and at the moment is the hot topic and we heard about policy capture which is part of state capture. So first let me tell you about a bit about this uh, policy assessment at the level of public organization. You can see here an example with Bulgarian border police and different uh, anti-corruption policies or rather policy tools which are in effect there. And this is a survey among officials. So border police officials are rating their own, uh, own anti-corruption policies. And you can see that, of course, they give uh, favorable ratings uh, for their own organization. But you can see on the right that uh, while formal compliance, what's on paper, is rated very high, the real compliance is uh, much, much lower. And this is because there is no strict control and especially no uh, sanctions uh, when these policy tools are not applied as it is on paper. So basically, in many Bulgarian public organizations, uh, it is possible that many of these very nice policies uh, and even laws, they remain fictitiously on paper, but are, do not lead to any particular changes in an organization. And uh, this is uh, the very same uh, indicator I was presenting at the beginning, the corruption pressure. However, here the question is uh, reversed a bit. We asked the public officials from the organization if they were offered a bribe. So if you remember, we asked the citizens if they were asked for a bribe, and here we ask public officials if they were offered a bribe. And uh, public officials in Bulgaria tend to reply very openly to this question because they said, yeah, I was offered and I uh, denied it, I am very honest. So uh, you can see here that uh, uh, the percentages are very high. Uh, one third of Bulgaria traffic police, notoriously uh, famous with many scandals uh, uh, regarding corruption and also a municipality part of Sofia municipality uh, and others to have very high corruption pressure and what the 20 years of experience with corruption pressure has showed is that when there is corruption pressure, uh, corruption incidents go ha uh, hand by hand with it. When uh, people are asked or offer, offered a bribe, usually there is corruption tra transaction. And uh, you can see here, I will uh, refer to previous pre presentations, uh, especially one which showed data about perceptions about several countries. And I noticed I was sitting over there and I was near the graph, and I noticed that Italy was nearly at the very top of the graph as perceived uh, as a very, very corrupt country. And Hungary, which is uh, one of the post-communist countries, uh, it was near the bottom of the, of, of the graph, despite many researchers talking about state capture there. And this is one of the problems with perception. Uh, we found this in our comparisons with Italian public organizations. Uh, you can see the green, the, the blue bars, uh, 
people in Italy tended to be more conservative when they rated their anti-corruption policies in their organizations, and they tended to be more honest. They were saying that there were problems, they were saying the anti-corruption policies did not work so well, but when they were asked if they were offered a bribe, they most of them said no. For example, in the municipality of Riva del Garda, I know it's a small municipality, but still only 6% of the employees said they were offered a bribe. While if you compare it with Burgas municipality, it's a large city in Bulgaria, uh, 25%. And in Swatina municipality, it's a small municipality part uh, from Sofia, the capital. Uh, nearly one third of the public officials there said they were offered the bribe. So we need to focus on experienced base indicators, on facts as much as possible, even if these are uh, through victimization surveys, not really hard data, big data, and so on. Even then, uh, if we ask about experiences, we uh, get more than if we ask only about perceptions. And of course, Transparency International now has the corruption barometer, which also uses experience-based indicators. And the Euro barometer on corruption also uses experience-based indicators. Some of them were adopted from the corruption monitoring system developed by CSD. And to wrap this up, AC policy assessment uh, at the level of public organization should be done and it shows what's going on in terms of actual measures at this level. However, very often uh, we see that there are serious problems there. And we start to ask ourselves, why is that? And then we come to this term which is very hot at the moment, state capture. And originally it started uh, from a business survey and was closely connected to illegal lobbying, but now it is synonymous to autocracy, to kleptocracy, uh, and to uh, oligarch uh, playing together with the government, uh, very often fusing together uh, the private interests with, uh, with government. And uh, this is a, wor a work in progress, but uh, this is our definition so far. I will not read it to you, but you will see that systematic is a key word in defining state capture. It is not a single bribe or several bribes, or it is not even a single scheme. It is, it is prevalent, it is systematic, and it is the exploitation of a governmental power for private gain. And it can, it can follow different routes. It can go through business capture, uh, through uh, illegal lobbying and uh, private uh, companies shaping the laws to their benefit, but it can also go through institutional capture, where whole institutions are captured. And if you have an anti-corruption body, uh, go, uh, which is part of the government, and this body is captured, you can imagine what can happen. Uh, private interests can use this body to go against their competition. Uh, political parties can go against their opposition. Very bad things can happen. And of course, political capture, which uh, includes clientelism and media capture. And if the media is captured, Guess what will happen with uh, public opinion surveys about corruption? Everything will be fine. The media will report every day great successes with uh, uh, fight against corruption, but the reality will be quite the opposite. And I will not go into black market capture, but you can see that it is uh, an important part of the model. And these are some preliminary results. Uh, I just wanted to show you how uh, experts, this is a very large uh, open expert survey. These are interim data by 60 experts and more, of, more than half of them are public officials. So this is not uh, the typical case of selecting experts who will criticize or who will conform. Uh, this is a really open uh, expert survey where more than half of the participants so, so far are public officials. And you can see how they rate uh, different important regulatory uh, 
public organizations and agencies in terms of their ineffectiveness. The first one is the Directorate for National Construction Supervision. So remember this construction. The second most ineffective is municipal, uh, municipal administrations. And the third most ineffective is the Commission for Protection of Competition. So uh, this Commission for Protection of Competition is supposed to prevent uh, illegal monopoly, but as you can see, it is rated by nearly two-thirds of the experts, including public officials, as ineffective. And here you can see how effective the anti-corruption policies are in several institutions, uh, including municipal administrations. 90% or more than 90 say there is uh, involvement in corruption or pressure for above, from above. And again, road infrastructure agency, again we go into construction. And again, the Commission for Protection of Competition, very high. And when it comes to uh, economic sectors, experts were asked to uh, choose those of the economic sectors which they think are monopolized. And you can see that 86% of the experts chose the trade energy sector, the wholesale of fuels and gas. And 72% chose the wholesale of pharmaceutical goods. And construction is also there, of course, 45% think it's monopolized. And uh, these answers, uh, these are the percentage of experts who answer to the question uh, about antitrust laws in the sector and say that laws in the sector help the formation of monopolies instead of preventing it. So you can see how many experts agree on this list of sectors. Of course, the list of sectors goes on and on and on, and these are only the most problematic one, but you can see the degree of uh, uh, how experts agree among themselves, despite the fact that more than half of them are public officials. And this is uh, my final slide, I think. Uh, this comes to show, uh, this now starts to go into details. Uh, for example, construction. We, we ask the experts, what's wrong with construction? And there are several options. And for example, for construction, you see that public procurement is very problematic. A small number of companies uh, win all the tenders. However, in wholesale of solid, liquid, and, uh, and gas, uh, then there the control and sections are applied selectively, which helps particular companies. So there you can have this theoretical uh, scenario where a, a regulating body goes against the competition and it that actually does more, har more harm than help. And uh, let me finish with this. This is only the tip of the iceberg. So uh, with this expert survey, we start uh, narrowing down objectively uh, the sectors and public organizations which look problematic. Uh, to, to use other words, we are trying to look objectively uh, where the big fish are. And then we move to case studies in economic sectors and in public organizations. And then there uh, we start going be, uh, below the surface. We start looking at econometric data on public procurement data and uh, on other objective data which is publicly available. And the end of all this is for investigators uh, to start uh, unraveling uh, real corruption uh, scenarios, real corruption scandals as the ones we discussed today. However, uh, this, is trying to, uh, this is trying to find where the corruption scandals will be in the future. This is not retroactively talking about corruption scandals which came out in why, one way or another. This is trying to be prognostical and to focus other uh, more specialized uh, bodies where to look. And, and this, uh, for example, these three sectors, two of them are known to be problematic, but the wholesale of pharmaceutical goods, 
is something which came out from, from this uh, survey. So if you hear about big uh, corruption scandals in pharmaceuticals, uh, in wholesale pharmaceutics in Bulgaria in the following years, then you will know that this was already uh, predicted here on this day. So thank you very much for your attention. Or in other words, if you overrate your performance, you cannot improve it. Therefore, you need precise data, yeah. right? Exactly. Um, that, uh, tālāk, uh, es Gruzijas pārstāvim, kuram es centiešos ļoti precīzi izrunāt vārdu, Zurabs Aznaurašvili. Please, the floor is yours. Hello. Uh, as already mentioned, I'm Zurab Aznaurašvili, representing State Audit Office of Georgia, and uh, we are in charge of monitoring political fights, finances and campaign um, expenditures. Uh, briefly, I will uh, mention uh, details of, about uh, the system of monitoring uh, in our country, and then um, we will provide some more practical uh, details uh, about um, identification, prevention, and combating political uh, corruption and problems related to these um, uh, issues. So, uh, regulations, we have different types of um, regulations and restrictions, including criminal code. Uh, so, uh, for example, vote buying uh, can be considered as a criminal case and the rest of the violations of uh, political uh, activities is administrative regulated by different uh, laws. Uh, mainly, uh, monitoring activities of political uh, parties in Georgia are monitored by State Audit Office and Central Election uh, Commission. Uh, in most cases, uh, State Audit Office is dealing with uh, more political and uh, corruption issues, uh, and uh, Central Election Commission in Georgian case is only dealing with uh, use of administrative resources. Uh, State Audit Office of Georgia is um, able uh, to audit activities and adopt uh, standards and instructions of uh, reporting uh, expenses, expenses and income uh, of political parties and candidates. Uh, and in case of violations, we are uh, filling protocol of administrative violation and sending uh, the cases to, to the court. So sources for identification of these um, violations uh, are declarations uh, that we receive uh, annually, uh, election period, and during a pre-election campaign every uh, three weeks, and also uh, donations are reported within five business days. Uh, and uh, this morning was mentioned uh, importance of uh, NGOs and uh, main source of also for our case uh, are also uh, local uh, observation organizations and uh, political parties, uh, but uh, of course media uh, that are uh, investigate that are also investigating some cases and we are getting that information through our media and monitoring uh, process. Uh, and one of the uh, most useful uh, tool, I think, is um, uh, transparency and electronic reporting systems uh, that we are um, we, that, that we have moved to full electronic reporting system, and uh, this process is making um, identification and also preventing uh, uh, process uh, easier. So new web page, searchable data filtering, and uh, 
the data that is easy, easy accessible is um, used for NGOs, media representatives, and for our uh, colleagues to identify possible uh, corruption matters. Uh, and uh, the electronic uh, systems are supporting, uh, giving us possibility to compare this uh, information with different uh, types of uh, public uh, databases. Uh, and uh, this is making uh, the process, our internal process also um, easier. And uh, for external users, users uh, this uh, gave uh, possibility uh, to get, have access on the uh, history of the databases uh, starting from 2011. Uh, and, uh, this new reporting systems uh, is main to, to increase transparency and to uh, get more access to this information, including uh, the information uh, that became searchable on uh, Google. So yeah, if you just search for a person uh, to link uh, to a company or to any kind of possible um, corruption risk, so these people will be also searched within our uh, databases. And yeah, the data will, uh, is provided with this easy accessible formats. Uh, and uh, prevention uh, tools are fines in uh, uh, main uh, fines and restrictions, uh, limitations of uh, donations. Uh, in uh, Georgia, we have uh, limited um, donation uh, ceilings for physical person, 2,000 euro, about 2,000 euro, and for legal entities, for, for 20,000 and 40,000 uh, euros. Uh, and uh, there are restrictions uh, that uh, every donor must be um, following. Uh, um, that, uh, yeah, to prevent uh, finances received, uh, for example, from oligarchs, and to have uh, big political uh, parties that are financed uh, uh, from by uh, one uh, rich uh, people. Uh, and uh, to limit these uh, restrictions and including uh, the limiting uh, legal entities uh, that must be uh, registered in Georgia and uh, we have limitations about uh, taking um, uh, public contracts. So uh, their income uh, uh, maximum 15% of their uh, income uh, can be received from the uh, direct public co contracts. This uh, is not excluding uh, fully uh, the risk of political corruption, but um, unfortunately, but uh, the, um, this type of limitations are uh, kind of giving us access to, uh, and possibility uh, to investigate these issues also. And um, fines. Uh, we are able to find uh, illegal donor uh, with dum double amount of uh, donation. Uh, at the beginning of uh, these regulations, when it was for enforced in Georgia in 2012, it was 10 amount of uh, fine, and uh, the fines were enormous. I, I will show it uh, in the next slides. Uh, but now we have a double amount in case of donations and uh, 10 amount in case of vote bank. And uh, different, yeah, uh, about uh, other possible violations that not uh, following regulations. And uh, to combat uh, the possible uh, violation, um, yeah, State Audit Office is quite limited. We don't have 
kind, in, kind of investigating power uh, that can be necessary. We are more like auditing, but also finding. Uh, so we are able to uh, interview donors and get uh, additional information from them uh, besides the public uh, uh, institutions and databases, for example, tax information. Uh, and uh, procurement uh, databases that are also important to uh, investigate possible uh, corruption uh, matters, but uh, yeah, fully investigating power uh, that can have several countries, for example, prosecuting uh, offices. Uh, I think that's what, what we need for full investigation. Uh, and um, cases that uh, we are uh, mainly uh, dealing and most popular cases uh, in our case. And yeah, I mentioned uh, illegal donations. So uh, in 2012, when it was 10 uh, amount of uh, donation, the fine was uh, uh, issued of for uh, about 40 million euros. So one person was fined uh, with 40 million euros. Uh, and uh, this uh, activity was um, uh, including uh, several different types of uh, supporting political party using uh, property, uh, offices, um, cars, and uh, different type of uh, company activities uh, that was in support of political party. So all this together counted uh, was about 4 million euro and uh, the fine was issued for 40 million euro. Uh, and uh, there are also lots of uh, issues uh, about hiding resources and in-kind donations, hiding in-kind donations. For example, uh, in 2013, we uh, found 120 offices uh, in uh, different uh, cities of country uh, that was not reported. So this... Uh, these offices were evaluated, the amount of rent was evaluated, uh, and uh, the fine was issued according to the uh, rent uh, rate that political party was supposed to pay. And uh, there are also uh, several issues in our cases uh, that um, there are cases uh, that quite often happens, uh, free concerts and uh, cases of vote buying and some kind of gifts uh, providing uh, during uh, different types of holidays, um, including wine, for example. And uh, yeah, just supporting uh, them in different types of activities. So uh, this type of cases are uh, quite uh, active and uh, our office is trying to investigate and uh, this is brief, uh, statistics what kind of what, how many cases we had during the last uh, five years actually yeah it's six year statistics but we had no case uh, in 2015 because not having elections and uh, now uh, this period in 2017 we are uh, having pre-election campaign for local elections uh, that will be at the end of the month. So the case is has already started and uh, the finding uh, process and investigating uh, process is uh, ongoing. And uh, uh, biggest uh, problem that was already mentioned during the introduction and the new kind of problem uh, we are facing now is uh, related to the social media and especially Facebook advertisements. There are lots of uh, campaign uh, taking place in social media now in uh, Georgia. It uh, includes different types of activities, uh, fake uh, Facebook pages, and uh, disinformation about uh, possible uh, unions uh, with, uh, with political parties and uh, these kind of activities in media uh, and not only uh, social media but also other medias uh, are quite active but um, 
we had access uh, to the uh, ordinary media resources. Facebook is it's kind of exception. Uh, we now are investigating uh, who is uh, paying for sponsored advertisements in Facebook. And this process is taking us abroad, not only within Georgia. So we are investigating these cases with Facebook administration. Um, in Facebook, there is a tool uh, for law enforcement bodies, and uh, this case uh, is ongoing process now with um, the Facebook office in Ireland. Uh, and uh, there was an issue of uh, fake Facebook uh, uh, page that is indicating that they are related to a candidate and they are spreading and financing the information, uh, wrong information about the candidate. Uh, so we have to investigate and get the information who is paying uh, and whose credit card is used in, in the Facebook. So this is the uh, issue that we are trying to get a, a link with. Uh, so according to our mind, uh, finance is, is key issues that we are auditing and that's why uh, I mentioned credit card and uh, sponsor who is paying uh, for the fake uh, pages. And also uh, without, un uh, without sponsored activities also there are lots of videos and information uh, spread nowadays on Facebook. So uh, this uh, issue uh, needs our attention and I think uh, um, for the uh, discussion that it will be uh, after our panel, uh, current and future challenges. I think uh, this issue, social media, is our current and uh, future challenge that uh, we all have to uh, take care and um, yeah, CNAB has good possibility to prepare for the elections next year and be prepared for this uh, issue, investigating this issue. Unfortunately, we were not uh, prepared for these local elections and now we are on this process. Thank you. Dienu mēs esam ļoti precīzi iekļāvušies laikā faktiski, un mums ir aptuveni 15 minūtes jautājumiem. Pirms es uh, um, dodu vārdu kādam no auditorijas, es uh, gribētu pirmo jautājumu uzdot uh, viesam no Brazīlijas, Fernandes kungam, par uh, nu, tiešām nu, ļoti iespaidīgo lietu. Un Iedomājoties, cik tur ir procesuālās darbības iesaistītas šī lietā, man ir jautājums, kas ir tie veiksmīgākie instrumenti, vai tie ir kaut kādi izveidoti task force, tā saucamie, vai cik ir, cik ir teiksim, iesaistīti prokurori šī lietā, lai visu šo lietu pieteikam efektīvi novadītu. Kas ir tie galvenie veiksmes instrumenti tieši no darba organizatoriskā viedokļa. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, in Brazil, the public uh, prosecution office is uh, independent. I think this is the first uh, point that I, I would like to highlight. So we, we are independent so we can uh, we are totally free to prosecute, pro to make our job, uh, no matter who is involved. Uh, so I think this is the main point. The other point is that the, the prosecutor general are elected by the, the class, by, uh, by we, by other prosecution, prosecutors, and uh, so, if the a prosecutor general doesn't uh, go well in the next election, he will not be elected again. So, uh, this is the first point. Uh, the other point, I think, we are a class with many, with uh, very mixed 
with, uh, with people from many uh, class and many parts of, of the country. This mixed, uh, mixed of people, I think, is very interesting to, to, to work with. The other thing I think is uh, we have been uh, we create task task force in mainly in in that three cities that I mentioned. Each one has a, has a, around ten prosecutors working, but besides the prosecutors, we have many uh, uh, many people working with us, like uh, data and analysts. Uh, uh, many professionals who work with us. In, only in Curitiba, where the investigation started, besides the f 15 prosecutors, they have uh, 50 per people working with them. So it's a, it's a good staff to work with. Besides, we have been in touch. Uh, today is very easy to communicate, communicate uh, with or with people all around the world, so we we are we are in touch with uh, uh, authorities in Switzerland, in the U.S., and many other countries. I think this the communications tools are very important, and technology is important, and I think the 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 the. The willing to, to change something, I think, is, is very important. I don't know if I've answered. Okay. Okay. Jautājums Gruzijas pārstāvēm. Jūs minējāt, ka tā problēma, ar ko es šobrīd saskarās par tī finansēšanas kontrolē, lielā mērā sociālo mēdīju saturs, tur Facebook, sponsored posts, nu, teiksim, viltus mājas, lapas un tam līdzīgi. Kad es domāju par šo lietu gan Latvijas kontekstā, gan arī globāli, Godīgi sajūt, es neredzu risinājumu. Izņemot, ja Facebooks pats ir gatavs atklāt nu, teksim, daudzas detaļas šāda veida darījumiem, vai arī ir kaut kāds starptautisks regulējums, kas uzliek šīm sociālajām tīklam tādu, tādu pienākumu, bet vai jums ir kādas domas par to, nu, kādā veidā kaut ko tādu vispār ir iespējams nokontrolēt? Uh. Well, I don't think that there is in something international uh, liability for Facebook, but at the beginning when we tried to communicate with Facebook, uh, at the beginning of uh, September, uh, we were not able. But at the end of September, there was a post by Mark Zuckerberg. It was, I think, 22nd of uh, September. They uh, expressed readiness to cooperate. So after that, uh, yeah, we submitted uh, this request. Um, so, like 10 days ago, maybe, uh, yeah, a few days ago, and today I received an email that, yeah, this case is uh, on the process. So I think they uh, are taking uh, this uh, issue, and um, I'm expecting uh, to get this information from the Facebook. So. Uh, I expect the cooperation with them. If uh, not this cooperation, then I don't think uh, that, yeah, without regulations, yeah, but it will be too strict to limit use of Facebook. Uh, then it can, uh, yeah, then maybe changes in the local laws. Because, yeah, no, we, we can't cooperate with uh, police offices because they uh, are investigating that kind of cases only in case of criminal uh, procedures. So uh, using administrative procedures is only left, I think, for now, Facebook. Paldies, but, um, paturpinot šo Vai skatoties uz uh, naudas iztērēšanu kampaņām internetā ir jāskatās uz tā saucamo būst pogu vai citu, kur procesuāli informācija nokļūst internetā? Vai uz naudu, kas tiek iztērēta šī satura sagatavošanā, 
kas bieži vien ir daudzreiz lielāk, lai sagatavotu video, piemēram, vai lai algotu cilvēkus, kas tur troļo vai tamlīdzīgi, un vai nevar šo apkarošanu vērst nevis tikai uzrunājot Facebook, bet mēģinot atrast cēloņu sakarību starp šī video veidotājiem un politiķiem, kuri tiek, kas teiksim, kandidē vēlēšanās. Yeah, we have some information that uh, the certain uh, pages can be related to certain people, but um, it's difficult to prove. Yeah, they are not indicating their own name on this uh, page, and uh, names can also be received from Facebook administration. And uh, separately uh, from this process, uh, yeah, names uh, who is administering, and, uh, and, yeah, who, yeah who is admin of the page and who is paying for sponsoring. Uh, and uh, besides that, uh, yeah, we, we can, uh, we are trying to identify videos, who took the video and who is spending uh, resources, uh, providing resources for making this kind of videos and uh, sharing on these uh, pages. And this is separate process that, yeah, also uh, not easy to investigate. I have a question uh, again and further question for uh, Mr. Asmarashvili. Something struck me, it's, it's a very high threshold for a donation from physical persons and from legal persons. 20,000 and 40,000, that's enormous. I don't know any other example of such donation from physical persons in the member states of the Council of Europe, don't you think it's, it's, it's a way to favor uh, the influence of oligarchs in the uh, local policy of uh, Georgia, especially when they can add both forms of donation, the donation of physical person and the donation of uh, legal person? Yes, uh, we have cases that uh, one person is donating personally and using uh, their own uh, company. Um, well, comparing to the Georgian reality and the average salary, yes, this amount is quite high. Uh, but uh, still, uh, when we make some uh, restrictions, uh, uh, to the donations, uh, the people are uh, finding solutions to override this uh, rule and they are getting some other people, and maybe family members and or co-workers, uh, who are doing, donating. Uh, uh, and uh, it, yeah, it can be then about half a million uh, donated by representative of uh, one company and uh, yeah, it must be also limited. Uh, and uh, this is, yeah, it's always, I think, like that. When we limit one, one uh, source, then they are finding uh, another source to uh, donate. It's a little context area, I should be Pēdējās pašvaldību vēlēšanas Latvijā ļoti uzskatām parādī to, ka atsevišķi politiķi, Patiesībā klasiskos mēdījus neizmantoja vispār, izmantoja tikai sociālos tīklus, Twitter kontus un Facebook kontus. Un līdz ar to patiesībā es domāju, ka tas būs lielākais izaicinājums visiem tuvākā nākotnē, kā panākt, lai šajos, nu, teiksim, šie konti, patiesībā lielākoties šajos projektos tiek iesaistīts privātu personas, arī šo te klipu veidošanā, kā mūsu pieradze rādīja, ka patiesībā tie ir it kā atbalstītāji, tā saucamie, to tajai vai citai politiskiem spēkam simpatizējoši cilvēki, līdz ar to šīs kampaņas paliek ar vienu gurūtāk izkontrolējamas, kā jūs redzat, kā nākotnē vispār ar to tik galā, jo tāpēc, ka Mūsu praksa rādījā, ka klasiskie mēdīja zaudē savu ietekmi un viss notiek sociālajos tīklos, jo šeit, manuprāt, nauda saskaitīta būs ļoti grūti. Paldies. I think, yeah, locally, yeah, 
monitoring body can be uh, prepared for this uh, issue, maybe by uh, some instructions. But uh, first of all, it uh, will be the cooperation with uh, Facebook. If we yeah, get access uh, to that information, then uh, yeah. While preparing for the uh, election, uh, that information can be spread out uh, to the political parties and uh, candidates and their uh, people connected with the parties. And they will know that uh, Facebook is sharing this information with us. Uh, so, yeah, I think they will be uh, like, it, it will prevent uh, this information, will prevent uh, uh, that kind of activities. But first of all, Facebook must start cooperating with us and that's the most important issue. And otherwise, it needs uh, changes in the uh, law, and then it's kind of investigating IP addresses of uh, Facebook users, and that kind of, it's more kind of uh, difficult issues then. Dato analīze droši vien, negan es esmu moderātors, man nav kā tiesības spausu savu viedokli, bet es droši vien, ka pirmām kārtām līdzīgi, kā lielos korupcijas lietās sekotu naudas plūsmā, tā šādos gadījumos es sekotu no cēloņu sakarībai, piemēram, ja tas bija no Geto Games cilvēks, kurš saņem finansējumu no Rīgas domes, tad es sekotu, nu, Kas to filmu taisīja, kur jūs viņu filmējāt, viņu profesionāli veidot un tādā veidā uzdodot jautājumus, iespējams, ka nejauši var nonākt pie situācijas līdzīgi, kā bija varbūt kārvašā? Ok, vai jums cik vēl kāds jautājums ir, Robert? Roberts no Dalnas. Man jautājums Fernandes kungam. Cik apmēram bija tas vidējais laiks iztiešāšanai konkrēti jūsu lietās? Jā. Nē, iztiešāšanā tieši. Bija notiesātie. Viņi sākās 14. gadā, vēl vēl projām notiek process. Bet bija par cietumu sodījumu minēts. Can you elaborate? Can you elaborate a little bit on uh, procedure where we where you are right now in the case? Okay. Uh, we, the, as I said, the case started in 2014, so we have almost uh, three years of investigation. But uh, it's not. It it all start with one investigation, but. Uh, as we, 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 we go deeper in the investigation, many other details and many other crimes uh, comes up. So we, we, today we have hundreds of investigation, each one in one, in, in, uh, some of them in the very beginning and some of them in the end. Uh, the, the early ones, there are people already convicted, and we have people that uh, are convicted in more than a hundred years in prison, uh, including the, some directors of Petrobras. But in Brazil, if you are con uh, convicted in a, in a penalty over 30 years, you, you, you stay in jail. Uh, uh, only 30, only, only 30 years. Uh, so, but you have a progression. Uh, one, uh, you, you can go, you can have a parole and everything. But uh, so, uh, answer your question, you have many things, uh, uh, many things going on. Each, each collaboration agreement that we do, there are many other things uh, that comes up. So, as I said, this, that those two first uh, collaboration agreement were uh, uh, just a, about one contract, one public contract from Petrobras. But when uh, Paulo Roberto Costa and Alberto Youssef, th that those guys, decided to do the collaboration agreement, they are obliged to tell everything that they know, every, every crime, 
every crime, the, all the crimes that they are, they practice or they know something about they are, uh, they have they have to to tell us. So we have to work in. We will open open box in, inside the box inside the box. So I don't know when the, all this will will gonna end. Uh, we are uh, start to getting tired of this because three years working the same thing uh, and many things going on in, in, in this. We, we have a, a president of the Republic, uh, Republic that was impeached. This new president is inv also involved. Uh, hundreds of politicians in, involved and next year we will have a, an election. Uh, I think uh, I, I, I'm anxious to see what people will decide because all in all, uh, everything ends in the in the polls, in the election. People need to to have the the conscience. conscience they they need, need to ch to choose different people. But in Brazil, uh, the politicians are the same, are the same, and they have. They have sons and, and, and daughters, and their sons and daughters go into the politicians. So our, um, our big oligarchic is that control the, 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 the big parties. Uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to, to, to seeing this change, this change in Brazil. Paldies mums ir šodien jābeidz šī priekšpēdējā paneļa diskusija. Būs kafijas pauze aptuveni 20 minūtes pirms un tad sekos noslēdzošā paneļa diskusija. Bet varbūt, ka mēs varam ar aplausiem novēlēt veiksmi mūsu kolēģiem turpmākajā darbā.